Ephesians chapter number five. Ephesians chapter number five. And while you're turning there, let me say it's good to see each of you in church. Good to see Jim Keen here this morning. We spend a little bit of time on the basketball court, and we'll leave what happened on the basketball court. Amen. But I'm glad he's here this morning. Good to see each of you. How many are visiting with us for the first time? Would you just raise your hand very quickly? I want to see how many are visiting with us for the first time. Or it's been a while since you've been here. Raise it up. Just keep it up. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you being here. If there's anything we can do to make your visit more of a blessing, please let us know. We certainly appreciate you being in the Lord's house today. We want God to speak to your heart. To all of our folks who are faithful at visiting and reaching out, we had over 50. I don't know exactly how many we had here yesterday, but we had a good number of folks between 50 and 60 folks out yesterday encouraging people in our community to be in church and to know the Lord Jesus. And God always blesses those efforts. And it's good to see guests in the Lord's house this morning. Amen? Good. You're in the book of Ephesians, and there are many things we could preach on and teach on in the subject or in the book of Ephesians this morning. But I want to finish a series of messages I've been preaching on Sunday morning this past month on the subject of together in Christ in our marriage. And we spoke on the foundations of a good marriage. We spoke of the fruits of a good marriage. We spoke of foolishness that hinders our marriages. And this morning, I want to speak on the fun in a happy marriage. You know, the Lord desires, I believe, for us to live with great joy. I don't believe God desires us to walk around like the Christian life is killing us, like it's the worst thing that ever happened to anyone. Because the greatest decision any of us ever made is the decision to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And the greatest life ever lived is the Christian life. And many times the devil wants to tell you that there's so much more out there that you should be involved in that can bring you joy and happiness. He wants to tell you that there's so many things that could fulfill what you're needing to be fulfilled in your life. But the truth of the matter is the devil's a liar. The Bible says not only is he a liar, he's the father of all lies. Every lie was born in the devil. And we think about that this morning. The devil's a deceiver. And he's deceived many of us in our in different areas of our life. And there's a there's a there is a fad that is sweeping our nation. There's an epidemic that is sweeping our nation. And Satan is destroying home after home after home. We look around the world and we know, man, it's obvious in the world in which we live, people have no commitment anymore. Listen, when you get married and you 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 Make that commitment. You're not only making that commitment to a spouse, you're making that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You don't get married because you're in love, because most people who are getting married don't understand love. You get married because it is the will of God, and God has led us to this point in our life. And when God joins us together, it should be one man, one woman for one lifetime. Now, I'm thankful for God's grace. I'm thankful for God's grace. I'm thankful for the Lord's mercy in our life. I'm thankful that God, when we, when we struggle or we deal with difficulties, that God doesn't get rid of us. He's still faithful to use us, and I'm grateful for that and thankful for that. But we need to understand that the commitment that we should have in our marriage is not only one to our spouse, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the nurturing ground, Pastor Sexton said to us, the nurturing ground for our generation is the home. Your children are learning about commitment and character and faithfulness and love in that home. And that needs to be vital, vitally important to each of us. The book of Ephesians, if you are there this morning, I want you to look down, if you would please. In Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 20. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves to one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also hath loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water. Look at the next three words there. By the word. We we cannot become more like Christ apart from the word of God. We cannot become the kind of husband or spouse or wife that we should be 
apart from the Word of God. Christian, if you, the only time you ever open your Bible is at a church service, then you're struggling spiritually. You're struggling in areas where God wants you to succeed because you cannot be what God wants you to be and you cannot become the Christian that God wants you to be apart from the Word of God. He says, by the Word, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. I want you to remember that verse. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. There's so many things that we could preach on there, and I could hit certain topics, and certain individuals would say amen, and really want us to preach on that subject matter there. But the Bible says when we think about marriage, and we think about God, God putting two people together, uh, God, I don't believe, the, I believe the Bible teaches us that God does not join us together to be miserable. Amen? What does the Bible call the spouse in Genesis a helpmeet? We're to encourage each other. We're to help each other. We're to be there for each other. God also reminds us in the passage that we just read that a man will leave his father and his mother and they will be one flesh. Listen, when you get married, when husbands and wives get married, they're one. And when they begin to go in the opposite direction and they begin to move in different directions and they begin to, to operate in a way uh, that they are uh, individuals away from each other and not moving in the same direction, you're trying to tear apart what God has made one. One flesh. And the Bible says that a husband that loves his wife loves himself. Listen, sir, if you will love your wife the way God intended for you to love your wife, it will be a benefit and a blessing to you. If you will lead your wife the way that God intended for you to lead, lead your wife, in the direction that God intended to, to lead your wife, then you will, you will not only be a blessing to her, but you will be a blessing and a benefit to yourself. The Bible says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. The struggle in our life many times is, is that we're too busy trying to go our own direction and do our own thing and we never stop to consider God or His Word and what He has asked us to do. As long as we're operating, as long as we're moving, as long as the mode of our life, as long as the direction of our life is away from God and His Word and away from God's, uh, God's purpose for our life, then we're going to continue to struggle. The Bible says here in the book of Ephesians, look there down if you would please with me. Verse number 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. No man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. God said we're to nourish and we're to cherish that relationship. Listen to me, sir, ma'am. You, you need to purpose in your heart to protect your marriage. You better purpose in your heart to protect your marriage. Don't put yourself in a situation that is going to wreak havoc or bring discouragement or harm to that relationship that God said you're to protect and to nourish. You're to guard it. How many of you have something that's important to you? How many of you have something that's important to you? You don't have to raise your hand. But you have something that's important to you. As a matter of fact, some of you right now are thinking about some things that are important to you. And what, what do you do with things that are important to you? You put them in a special position, don't you? You put them in a special place. There maybe I have, a, I have a, uh, uh, an area in my home where I keep some things that are valuable to me or that are important to me. They're not valuable to, to just anyone. They're valuable to me. And I have a place that I keep those things in. And they have a special place. I have a special place that I keep them. 
Listen, your marriage ought to always be at the forefront of your mind. Your relationship with your spouse should always be at the forefront of your mind when you go about your day because what you do throughout your day not only impacts you because you're one flesh, it impacts your spouse. What you do, ma'am, not only impacts you and what you say and how you behave and how you act not only impacts you, it impacts your husband because you're one flesh. And you, you need to have a special place for that marriage in your life. There's, there's, a, there's a place where I keep those valuable things. And those things bring me joy. There are certain pictures that I have in my office. There are certain pictures that I keep around that I look at. And every time I look at them, they bring me joy. They bring a smile to my face. There's some pictures that I look at, my wife and I sometimes, we have a wall in our home that's filled with pictures from the time that our kids were little to uh, recent as, as can be. And uh, we sometimes go by that wall, we just stop, and each one of us will find the other just staring at that wall sometimes. How I many you know what I'm talking about? You're looking at those pictures and you're thinking, where did those kids go? They grow up. Sometimes they, they, they make us sad a little bit, don't they? They're precious to us. We nourished him and we cherished him. And in our marriage, we are to protect it. We are to nourish it. It ought to have a special place and it ought to have a special position in our life. But as we think about our marriage, those things that we nourish and we cherish, we nourish them and we cherish them because they bring us great joy. They bring us great joy. Most people today are not living up to the potential that God desired for their marriage. Most people today are struggling to get to where God wants us to be because we have so many other things that are in our life and so many things that are consuming us and filling up that we have no time to, to nourish and to cherish and to place emphasis and, and to put the, the marriage that God intended us to have in the right position in our life. And we, we struggle and we, we wonder, how can I make it better? How can I make it better? The interesting thing is, is that when we're struggling, we often want to blame everyone else around us for why we're struggling. And God intends for us to have a marriage that we cherish, that we nourish, that's bringing us great joy. I believe the Bible teaches us that, that we're to enjoy the joy of the Lord is our strength. We're to act as if that relationship with that husband or that wife is just as important as the relationship as Christ in the church, we look at the Word of God and we see the value that Christ placed upon the bridegroom, upon the church. He was willing to come to this earth and die for it, to give all that He had so that we might have eternal life. And that should be, our same, that should be the same attitude that we have as husband and wife. That we're willing to go as far as needs to go. As we're to, we're, we should be willing to do whatever needs to be done. That we're to set aside whatever needs to be set aside so that there can be joy in that relationship. I, I used to say something often, and my, my, my boys have picked it up when I ask them about something that they've learned from me. One of my sons will say, 12 years old, you'll be a good man. Amen? Happy wife, happy life. But you know what? Our happiness truly cannot be found in each other. It has to be found in Jesus Christ. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We think about joy in our marriage and the fun in a happy marriage. Listen, God doesn't intend for us to live miserable. Listen, I would hate. Can you imagine getting married? Can you imagine getting married? And, and saying I do and man, you go on your honeymoon and you come home and you wake up, you know, a couple days after your honeymoon. And she doesn't really act like the way she was acting on the honeymoon. She don't even look like what she looked like on the honeymoon. <laughs> Man, you think, what have I done? <laughs> Can you imagine doing that? No. Man, when I got married and my wife and I got married, we were excited about being married. We were excited about being married to each other. I, I, I share the story all the time. Listen, uh, when, when the day that we got married, I couldn't tell you really who did what or what happened because she was focused on me and I was focused on her. And there was an excitement and a joy that came from anticipating being married to each other. Listen, that shouldn't fiddle out the older you get. Well, it just ain't the way it used to be. Then something's wrong. Amen? Listen, can you imagine raising your children 
And some of you are in this position now. Can you imagine raising your children? And my wife and I had four and six years. We did not know what sleep was for many years. But God saw us through it. Bradley, God will see you through it, all right? God saw us through it. You'll be okay. You'll make it. Man, you're raising those kids and you're invest- you think, man, I should have invested in diapers. I should, have, I should have invested in baby formula. Somewhere along the way, somebody missed the greatest investment of all time. And listen, you think, how in the world are we going to get through this? And then they become teenagers and their problems completely switch. And you, you start trying to help them and nurture them through that. And listen, you, by the way, don't stop parenting your kids when they become teenagers. Don't just leave them out there to flounder in the world and make their own decision. Those are the most important times that they need you in their life. But you go through all that, and then your kids grow up, and they move out, and it's just you and mama left. You think, well, it ain't what it used to be. Oh, my goodness. That is not where God wants us to arrive. That's not where God wants us to be. He wants us to find that joy, that nourishing, and that cherishing, that, that, that love that makes this relationship valuable to us. So how do we find that? How do we keep that joy? How do we have that fun in marriage? Listen to me. There are many things that people believe will cause you to have a successful marriage. But the world's definition of success and God's definition of success are not the same. What the world promotes about a relationship is not what God promotes about a relationship. The physical aspect of marriage is vital. It's vitally important. But that's not where you find your joy. That's not where you find your contentment. That's not where you find your your fulfillment because, friend, while it lasts and while it's a blessing, it's it's for a moment and it's fleeting. And and we we have placed so much emphasis. The world is so sexually driven today. Everything is sold by sex and everything is sold by the way it looks and the way it appears. And, friend, listen to me. The relationship that you must have with your husband and wife must go far beyond the physical relationship. The Bible says here that we're to cherish it, we're to nourish it. It brings us joy. It's important to us. So how do we do that? I want you to write these three things down and we'll be done this morning, all right? How to have fun in a happy marriage or fun in a happy marriage comes when? Fun in a happy marriage comes when? Take your Bibles, if you would, please. We're going to turn in Scripture this morning. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me, all right? Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, chapter number 16. How do we have fun in marriage? Fun in marriage. Can I tell you, the kind of fun that God wants you to have is not the kind of fun the world offers. You say, man, we had a great time last night. Well, what'd you do? I can't remember. But I remember it was fun. Well, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? I'm not certain what we did. The world's idea of fun and God's idea of fun are two different things. Can I say to you this as well? That the world's fun or joy is temporary. And God, God's fun is lasting. I want God's people to enjoy their marriage. You say, well, Pastor Brian, you, you you, you just don't live in reality. You just don't live in reality. You just don't understand. Oh, I understand completely. Listen to it. Listen to me. Every one of us get up every morning and put our pants on the same way. One leg at a time. Every one of you ladies get up every morning, and it might take you 30 minutes. It might take you an hour and 30 minutes to get dressed, but you you, you get it done. We all have to deal with the same things. How many of you have ever had one of those magnifying mirrors, and you ever bought one of those magnifying mirrors? You know what I'm talking about? What are those things called? Are they they called a magnifying mirror? How many of you ever had one of those things, you know, where your face gets about four times than what it's supposed to be? And you want to, you know, you're trying to find hairs that aren't supposed to be in a certain place, and you pull them out and all that kind of good stuff. That was one of the worst things ever invented. Man, I get in front of the mirror and I try to stand as far away as I can. Yep, still looks all right. Everything's looks good there. Every one of us struggle in areas in our life. Every one of us have conflicts that we have to address. Every one of us deal with challenges, and every one of us face difficulties. But God is greater than any of that. And when you begin to magnify the Lord and humble yourself, the greater God becomes and the less important we become. How do we have our fun in a happy marriage comes with? Look what the Bible says in Psalms chapter number 16. Look what the Bible says in verse number 7. It says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. 
My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is what? Glad. Therefore, my heart is glad. And my glory, what's the next word? Rejoiceth. My flesh also shall what? Rest in hope. Why? Why is all this? Keep reading. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer the Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Get this. And in thy presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures for everyone. I want you to look in verse number 11 and look at the middle part of the verse there where the Bible says, In thy presence is the, what's the next word? Fullness. The complete, the pinnacle, the, the whole conclusion is the fullness of joy is found in one place in the presence of God. Now, the world's not going to teach you that. The world's not going to say that, that God's presence will bring you happiness. The world's going to say this bank account, this place, this car, this relationship, that's going to bring you fullness of joy. But friend, according to the Word of God, there is only one that offers complete satisfaction and fulfillment, and that is Jesus Christ. The fullness of joy. Look at what the Bible says, how effective the Lord is in our life. Number one, write it down. Fun and a happy marriage comes when we settle for God's presence. So many people are looking for so many other things. They're looking for something else. They're trying to attain and achieve and accomplish something else and possess something else. And we think, why in the world aren't we happy? I have all this and I'm doing all this and I'm going all of this. And I just can't seem to find that joy because God said none of it brings complete joy. True joy is found only in the fullness of the presence of God. Look what the Bible says that God does to our life. Look in verse number 8. He says, uh, verse number 9. He says, therefore my heart is glad. Can I tell you a number of times that I've heard people say, my heart is broken. My heart is broken. My heart is broken over my husband. Or my heart is broken over my wife. Or my heart is broken over my children. My heart is broken. And what does God say? He says, the presence of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, He says He makes my heart glad. God will never hurt us. God will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never do or allow us to go through anything that He does not provide the ability to overcome. He says, my heart is glad. Look down with me, please. And my glory rejoiceth. He says, not only is my heart glad, he said, the, 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 the presence, the, the, what my life reveals, what people see about me is rejoicing. What they see about me is joy that I find in Christ. What they see about me is what God has done for me, not only on the inside, but the joy that I possess on the outside. Man, Christians, need to, Christians have the, the biggest reason to be the happiest people in all the world. How many of you are saved to know, you know Jesus Christ as Savior? Say amen. amen. You know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior? Well, you know, all you miss is hell. All you miss is eternity separated from God. Listen to me, if the whole world falls apart, we have everything in Jesus Christ. He says, my, he says, my glory rejoices. Look at this. It's, move on, please. Well, Pastor Brian, the flesh is against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and we've heard you preach and teach that over and over again. But the Bible says that the presence of God, look, he says, my flesh also shall rest in hope. God says the more of, of God we get into our life, the more of God we, the more we surrender our life to God. He says even our flesh begins to rest. Listen, when you begin to replace things in your life that shouldn't be there with things that God wants there, the more rest you'll find. How many of you had, how many of you have ever, you, you, some people at night when they get ready to go to bed, you know, they, they don't read certain things or they don't watch certain things or they don't listen to certain things because it'll keep them awake at night. Man, you start getting antsy and you start thinking about them and you can't go to sleep and I'm terrible at that sometimes. But listen to me, the more that we let God be in control, the more peace will be present in our life. You see, fun in a happy marriage comes when you settle for the presence of God. 
When you understand that there is nothing else that matters but that God is present. You say, Pastor Brian, I feel alone. Do you know when God is present, you're never alone? You say, Pastor Brian, I feel like I have no hope. When God is present, even your flesh rests in hope. You say, Pastor Brian, I have nothing to rejoice. You just don't know what the situation is. The Bible says God doesn't break our heart. He makes it glad. And so many of us, listen to me, church. We want to point a finger at the world, but listen to me. So many of us, church, we're running the road of life trying to find something that's going to bring us happiness. And at every turn and at every, every road we go down, we arrive at a dead end and realize this, that whatever this or that was cannot do for me what only God can do for me. He says, listen to me, there is, there is, look at it again, please, in verse number 11. He says, thou wilt show me the path of life, and in thy presence is the fullness of joy. Say, so what do we need in our homes? We need the presence of God. Here's my question to you. Is God welcome in your home? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in. Christ is a gentleman, and maybe this morning he's knocking at the door of your marriage. But you're too busy running around inside trying to fix everything that you don't want him to see. And God says, wait, it'll never be fixed until I'm present. The fullness of joy. He says happy marriages, fun in a happy marriage comes when God is present. Secondly, fun in a happy marriage comes, turn with me if you would please, just over a few pages to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Fun and a happy marriage comes. Psalms 100. Look at it if you would, please. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Verse number two. Serve the Lord with what? Gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is is good. You say, Pastor Brian, where does fun come in a happy marriage? After we settle for the presence of God. When you understand, listen to me, I need to be and you need to be exactly what God wants us to be. The goal should be to be exactly what God wants us to be. For us to have the kind of marriage that God wants us to have. And stop for just a moment, please. You cannot be what God wants you to be, sir, on your own. You cannot be what God wants you to be without your spouse. I, I was sharing with someone just recently, we were talking about marriage. And, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes men are like a bull in a china shop. We just go until something bigger than us stops us. We'll go and go and go. And we turn around and we wonder, where's our wife at? Why isn't she here beside me? Well, the reason she's not is because you left her back there. And no matter, get it, please. When you leave your wife, I was going to ask one of these young men to help me, but I didn't want to confuse any of you folks here this morning. When you leave your wife here and you run off here like a bull in a china shop, whether it's spiritually, financially, uh, you know, on your job, whatever it may be, and you, you blow everything up and you arrive at this destination and you complain because she's not standing there with you. The only way to get her there with you is to go back to where you left her and bring her along beside you. So there's much wisdom in saying, instead of running off up here and blowing everything up and having to come back and do it again, it's much wiser just to bring her along from the beginning. And by the way, sometimes she has to bring you along. Sometimes she has to settle you. You see, sir, while you're searching for success, your wife is looking for security and stability. While you're searching to be the, everybody's hero, she's looking for that security and that stability that comes from a relationship that's grounded upon something that will never fail. Don't leave her behind. Bring her with you. You're one flesh. When you leave her behind, you're tearing apart what God meant to be together. He said that we're to have the presence of of the Lord, the, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ brings that joy. Then secondly, he says here in Psalm 100, look, serve the Lord with gladness. Number two, fun and happy marriage comes when we seek to be used by God. 
when I, when I seek to be used by God. You know, one of the things that, that sometimes we hear often when we're trying to encourage marriages is a wife will say something like this. He's got so much going. He's so busy. I don't feel like I matter to him. My opinion doesn't matter. How I feel doesn't matter. What I'm dealing with doesn't matter. Can I tell you, God is never going to lead your marriage in a place. God is never going to promote or push your marriage in a place where your spouse feels insignificant to you. God's not going to lead you there. He's not going to lead you to a place that will cause your wife or your husband to think she or he doesn't care what I think or how I feel. The reason we get there is we stop serving God and we start serving ourselves. Can I tell you, David got in trouble. I want to number the people. Well, that's, that's not a bad thing. I, I want to see what God has done. You could put all kinds of twists and turns on it, couldn't you? You know what David was doing? He was serving himself. And it cost him. And you can be busy doing things that are good things, but are not what God wanted you to do, and miss the blessing that God has for you. What does the Bible say? He said we're to serve the Lord with gladness. We're to seek to be used by God. We're seeking to be used by everything else. We're seeking to accomplish everything else other than what God wants us to accomplish. I know people who will spend and go and do and accomplish something, and as soon as it's accomplished, that temporary fulfillment is gone. And you know what has to happen? They've got to have something else. But when you serve the Lord, when you seek to be used by God, God says it produces gladness in your life. Serve the Lord with gladness. Number three, fun and a happy marriage comes when we settle for God's presence, when we seek to be used by God. By the way, that settling for God's presence has to do with the inner man, but seeking to be used by God has to do with the outer man. Number three, and we'll be done. Third John. Fun and a happy marriage comes when we settle for God's presence, when we seek to be used by God. But number three, when we show the priority of Christ to our children. Verse number four of 3 John, I have no greater, what? Joy. Let's try it again. 3 John, verse number four, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Say, I want to be happy when my children are grown and gone. I want my marriage to be joyful. I want there to be a peace and contentment and fulfillment when the house is empty and it's just me and mom. Well, you'll struggle with that if they're not walking in truth. You'll have a hard time with that. What did the Bible say? What did we say just a moment ago? Cherish and nourisheth. They're important to us. They're valuable to us. There's no greater asset that you have as a family than your children. And you better show them the priority that Christ needs to have in their life while you parent them. I hear people say, I'm trying to be the example that I should be for my married children. I'm trying to be the example that I should be for my married children. And that's wonderful, and we should be. But the example that you set for them begins long before they're married. The example that you should set for them begins long before they're married. And husband, dad, your children are learning about the importance of God. They're learning about the importance of God from not just your words, but how you live. And they're learning about love and patience and kindness, mom, not just from your words, but by how you live. And if you want your children to walk in truth, when they're 20 and 30 and 40 years old, you better teach them about the priority of God when they're 3 and 4 and 5 years old. Listen, I'm not trying to be your kids' parents. It's not my responsibility. It's not the church's responsibility to save your kids. 
Help me now, I won't die. I know it's 1245, but good night. We can watch a baseball game for three hours. It's not the church's responsibility to say, by the way, the work we're trying to do here will help some of you 20, 30 years down the road if you'll listen. Help me now, some of you that know better. We're not trying to, it's not the church's job to save your children. It's our job, you young men, pay attention. It's not my job, it's not our youth group's job to, to salvage your child. It's our youth group and our youth pastor and our, our churches and our pastor's responsibility to come alongside the parents and encourage what should already be taking place in that home. And the world says, well, we're going to scar them or we're going to hurt them if we tell them no or we try to straighten them out or, 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 or set them in the right direction. He said, one of the worst things you can do for your children is to, is to tear down those that are trying, that have been put in place by God to help them become the Christians they should be. One of the worst things you can do is tear those people down. The pastor is not God. Amen? Y'all can say amen to that. I mean, this isn't a cult. The pastor's not God. But when you tear him down in front of your children, or you rebel against what the preacher is preaching from the Word of God, you're telling your children what God says doesn't matter. Well, I don't believe that. Believe it if you don't want or don't believe it if you don't want to. But the Bible says I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. They don't learn to love and live for God and serve God after they get out of your home. They learn it while they're sitting in your home. You better place a priority on that. You better make that a priority in your life. And listen to me, we've taught them and we've, listen, get this please, make, don't miss this, please don't miss it. We've made investments in our children financially. We've made investments in our children physically. We've made investments in our children intellectual, intellectually. We put everything in their hand that we think they need except a spiritual investment. Your children are going to learn to love God by watching you love God. And if you let that slip, if you let anything else take priority, friend, then when they're 20 and 30 and they run off to the far country, friend, you're going to wonder what in the world happened and you're going to have to say, God, help me, help me right now in this moment to understand the value of teaching my three, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-old that God is important. He's a priority. He's a priority. You say, Pastor Brian, your kids haven't grown up yet. You'll learn one day. If that's your attitude, it's a terrible one. I don't think our kids have to run off to the far country to have a good testimony. I don't think we have to lose them and get them back. I'm glad we can, and I'm glad God can do that, and I praise the Lord for that. But it doesn't have to be that way. Teach your children to learn to love God. Make a spiritual investment in their life. Spend the time that we spend with all the other investment. Spend the same amount of time. If we just spent the same amount of time making a spiritual investment in their life. Well, I do make a spiritual investment. I'll bring them to church. I'm glad that you do. But remember, they're learning about the importance of God, not from the preacher, but from you. The church is just coming alongside what you're already supposed to be doing. They're learning about love and faithfulness and commitment, Mom, not from watching a Sunday school teacher. They're learning it from you. Let it be a priority in your life. You say, Brian, Pastor Brian, why would you say all those things? Because I want you to have a happy marriage. I want you to enjoy what God has given you. I don't want you to be miserable. And you cannot do that apart from God and His work. You can't do it. Let's pray together.